Last weekend, The Flash opened in theaters and it is not doing well at the box office. <sighs> Whoops. I'm a little bit late to the party, but it's time to do a DCEU film and TV show tier ranking. create your own DCEU tier ranking. I'll put the link down below in the description for the template that I used. If you create one, share it on your social media, Instagram or Twitter, and tag me. I will share some of my favorites that were sent my way, the ones that I found the most interesting. Those links are down below in the description for that template, as well as my handles for Instagram and Twitter. Instagram is the best place to get a hold of me. I respond to almost all of my DMs and let's get started. We'll kick things off at the beginning with Man of Steel, and this is a movie, it took me a little bit to fully process it because it is such a different take on Superman. I always enjoyed the film, I was always intrigued by the film, but every time I've rewatched it, I've enjoyed it a little bit more and found something new, some new detail that I just thought was awesome. So at this point in time, I put this one all the way up in the great category. I think Henry Cavill is an interesting new take on the character that just has a presence on screen. Zack Snyder, as divisive and polarizing as he can be, I think knows how to deliver movies that actually make an impact. That you have an opinion on them, and in the case of me, I really enjoyed this film where he builds out a very different type of lore for Krypton that ties into kind of the ideas being explored throughout the film. He has this very kinetic weight of directing action. And so we get to see a Superman that really gets to punch people in the face and you get a fantastic Hans Zimmer score in here. Put it all together. It's very different from the Superman I grew up with, but that's kind of what I like about it that it brings something new to the table. It is a new 21st century take on the character and I put it in that great category. Moving right along, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, the ultimate edition. I don't rewatch the theatrical cut, so I can't really rank it in a list like this since I only watch the one that's 30 minutes longer that wasn't released in theaters. And in many regards, I understand why this movie is very polarizing. I can understand why a bunch of people just don't like it. They find it too dark, too convoluted. For me, I find it to be ambitious, but flawed. I, I love a lot of the things that are in this movie, that it's trying to actually play out. If Superman shows up and that sort of destruction happens, that would be monumental for humans. <laughs> and how different people would react to it. And so you get Lex Luthor's reaction and you get the government's reaction. And then you get all these montages of different people seeing Superman in action, and how they respond to him. And of course you get Batman's reaction to it with that central concept. And with that, there's just a lot of things in here that I love, but there's also just a lot of things in here in general. This definitely feels like too many movies for one movie <laughs> all kind of crammed in there because it's trying to be Man of Steel 2. It's trying to be uh, a Lex Luthor film. It's trying to set up Justice League. It's trying to be a movie about our two heroes fighting each other. It's doing the death of Superman with Doomsday all in one movie while exploring these ideas of what if gods were among us, or in this case, Superman is perceived as a god is among us. But there's still so many things in here that really do work for me. I, I kind of like that it's dark and bleak. There's so many things here that are enjoyable, but it is absolutely a flawed film that gets too convoluted to try and mash all of these plots into a single film. But if you get the ultimate edition, I think it, it does work well enough. Suicide Squad, we'll cut to the chase on this one. This one is bad, but fun. And that's very frustrating because I think there was all the potential for this to be a solid Suicide Squad film. I think they got largely the right cast. There's a bunch of, you know, when you got Will Smith in there and Margot Robbie on her upswing of becoming an A-lister, there's a lot of talent in the crew itself. There's moments that work, but then it's been well-documented. David Ayer had six weeks to write it. He shot the movie 
And then because of the release of Deadpool, because of the res- response to Batman v Superman, because of the response to some of the trailers, they brought in the people that cut the trailers to re-edit the movie. They commissioned reshoots that David Ayer wasn't really involved in. He's very publicly said this is not his movie. This is not what he was planning on doing and kind of vaguely described all the things about the film that are different, which is pretty much everything except the cast itself. And so it's, it's an example of a movie where I know that I'm watching a compromised vision. There's fun to be had here. There's things that I like about it. But overall, it is a bad movie with fun bits. And I I wish, I hope someday we do get to see the air cut. I don't think it'll be as good as Zack Snyder's Justice League, but I certainly think it'll be an improvement over whatever this thing is. Big jump in quality, we have Wonder Woman. And this is a film they've been trying to make for a very long time. Over 10 years back, uh, Joss Whedon took a crack at it, wrote a script and it's out there. He couldn't crack the code on how to do it. And then as time passed, they did a TV show about five years before this movie came out and they didn't even pick the show up because it was really bad. I was very skeptical about whether they would be able to make a Wonder Woman movie where you have a woman in like a U.S. flag swimsuit flying around in an invisible jet with a a lasso. I just didn't know how that translated. But this movie is great. This was just a great addition to the DCEU that managed to tell a story with very endearing characters where you bought into the relationship between uh, Diana and Steve like you as you go on the journey with them they find all these moments to make her very maternal but still be this very strong warrior it has themes and ideas that it's exploring it has very cool action it has comedy without going too far with the comedy it kind of has everything that you want in a superhero movie. And the only thing holding it back from getting all the way up into that S tier is that I don't think it's final little stretch is its strongest. It kind of ends on a note where it just kind of goes into, it goes, it gets too talky for a little bit. And then it maybe get feels like we just hard rush into a big CGI finale, not as memorable as just one guy saying that he's going to get in a plane because he can be the hero that day, but she needs to be the hero going forward. That's so potent, so much more memorable than all the other kind of stuff in the finale. So, and even the the director, Patty Jenkins, kind of indicated that they pushed her to make it a little bit more flashy. And I don't know that that was necessarily for the best. That'll bring us to Justice League. When I first saw this in the theaters, I would have probably put it in like that at bad but fun category that there are things that are amusing about it, but it's it's kind of all over the place. Tonally, the story's clunky, it's awkward. It's not very good, but it is kind of fun, and it's nice to see the Justice League on the big screen. But as, as soon as it was essentially revealed what went on behind the scenes with this movie, it just became really gross to me, and kind of an example of how Hollywood can just just have no moral compass. So as you start to learn that they use the death of Zack Snyder's child as a way to make changes to the movie that they wanted to make anyway, that the executives demanded an early, earlier release date than it should have been in order to get their bonuses for that year. So VFX shots weren't completed. They rushed to deadlines. <laughs> and then just in general, having they mandated a runtime under two hours. And Joss Whedon and <laughs> Zack Snyder's styles are not remotely compatible. The way they shoot scenes, the way they light scenes, the cameras that they use are all totally different. And they try to just mash these two things together. So when you look at it, it doesn't go together. It's totally all over the place. It truly is just this Frankenstein monster of a movie that its creation, in my mind, w- was deeply immoral, what they did here. Even the treatment of the actors apparently was terrible. So 
this to me is just one of the grossest movies in existence. So it's well below even the F category. It gets its own category at the bottom where it is burning in hell. And then that'll bring us to Aquaman. And I'll cut right to the chase on this one. I think that this one is fun, but safe. It's a movie that's just a enjoyable blockbuster. At times, it's, it's kind of going for low-hanging fruit with, you know, simple jokes. We've got pop music cutting in randomly at certain times in the movie. You got Jason Momoa just like, glaring at this, this right at the camera in the middle of some of these action sequences while a guitar goes like Broom. it's cheesy it's corny but it's also very entertaining and it's very competently done it takes kind of a you know pop version of shakespearean storytelling with a battle for a throne with stepbrothers half brothers Family members dying in exile. There's globe trotting. There's a lot of stuff in here. And we also have a bunch of sea monsters battling each other. But James Wan knows how to kind of pull something of this scope and size together and make it work. He shoots the action sequences with long, wide takes so you can see everything happening. It can be very energetic. So it's just not really breaking any new ground here, but it's a competent, fun version of a big underwater epic. Moving right along, we've got Shazam. And this was such a pleasant surprise. When they announced they were doing Shazam, I was like, I don't know how that translates to the big screen. And then some of the set photos came out with Zachary Levi in the suit. And a lot of times superhero suits they don't look great when they're not filmed right. And so it looked very awkward, strange. And so it didn't have necessarily the best buzz. And then the trailers, they were kind of fun. And when I watched the movie, I, I just thought it worked on way more levels than I was, was expecting. In particular, it's a movie that has so much more heart than I was expecting. It is a story about finding family and has this tragic story about Billy and why he's always run away from people and finally gives him the family that he's been looking for. But it's also really funny. Zachary Levi is fantastic as a man-child. I like the way that it visualizes a lot of the effects inside of the movie. And so it worked so much better than I was expecting. I think at times it, it, it leans too much into horror a couple times. We got a horror director brought in to tell the story and there's just a few minutes in it where that really takes over and gets, I would say, too dark compared to the rest of the film where I think as a father sometimes and what can I show my kids? 95% of this movie, great for them. 5% was like, oh, that demon just ate a guy's head off. That might have been a little bit too far. So a little bit of tonal issues in there for me. Otherwise, I'm saying this one's great. That'll bring us to Birds of Prey and the fabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, or as normal people call it, Birds of Prey or Harley Quinn. What a long, cumbersome title. But a movie I actually have always enjoyed. This one is going to go one, it go in the different but flawed category. I know that this is one of those movies that the internet and YouTube in particular just love to dunk on. And I get a little bit of where that's coming from. I can see some of the criticisms that people made and other stuff. Uh, I think people were probably just being too hard on it or not seeing some of the things in there that are kind of fun. For me, when I watched this movie and when I have rewatched it several times, I see kind of like a early Guy Ritchie movie set in the DCEU with this unreliable narrator, Harley Quinn, telling this street level story. That to me is a lot of fun that where it's not trying to be about saving the world or even saving the city. It's much smaller in scale. I like that. I want more superhero movies like that. It involves practical effects rather than and, and practical stunt work rather than a bunch of CGI and people in green screens. 
you have someone on roller skates being pulled behind a car. For one action sequence in here for the prison sequence or jail sequence, they brought in the John Wick guys. And in fact, Sam Hargrave, who just a couple weeks back directed Extraction 2. Like he's one of the stunt guys that Harley Quinn takes out when she goes to the jail and you get a bunch of cool fight choreography in there as well as some cocaine. I do cocaine! Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Not all the stunt work is great. Some of the stuff in the, the final fight, if you watch what's going on in the background, very spotty at times. Uh, it doesn't all work. There's some ideas in here that, you know, I, I get why some people look at it, scoff at it or whatever. I liked it. <laughs> That'll bring us to one of our COVID releases, Wonder Woman 1984. And this was a massive drop in quality from the first film. Since it was a fairly early release when they started putting movies out kind of again during COVID, it was just fun to see a big movie on the big screen again. So I was more positive on it than I probably should have been in my initial reviews. But then it was like one of those movies that like the more you think about it, the more you hear reviews and everything everybody says, you're like, oh, yeah, there. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of problems with this movie, and my uh, feelings on it have only, like, just sharply dropped since initially watching it. So I'm going to put this one in the bad but fun category. There are moments in here that work. There's some homages to the Richard Donner Superman movies that I enjoyed. A few fight sequences that kind of worked. A little bit of fish out of water humor that was like, that was kind of nice. On a story level... On a thematic level, I, I think this movie just absolutely just crumbles under any scrutiny whatsoever. You've made a huge mistake. Just the basic plot line of our villain is a guy that is like granting wishes to people. is is And he's like desiring more power or something doesn't really work. And it's trying to like thematically tie to Wonder Woman and what does she want? And we're going to bring back the love of her life. And the way this all plays out, I, I just, it doesn't really work. And building into a finale where we're like literally having a guy like talking to TVs or something and just like, oh no, what happened here? These are not good ideas. So... I don't think it's a total disaster. There's fun. There's moments that kind of elevate it. Some performances that elevate it, but they just picked a totally wrong direction to go with this film. Totally wrong plot, totally wrong themes and bringing Chris Pine back. Not a great idea. Time to talk about our HBO Max original Zack Snyder's Justice League. And I was one of those people that always said, I would love to see Zack Snyder's Justice League, but we're not going to see it for 15, 20 years. And when we do see it, it will be incomplete. I would love to see this thing. And it actually happened. And I went into it expecting it to be a little bit better than Batman v Superman. In the case for me, I'm, I'm someone that really liked Batman v Superman, but I thought it was flawed. So I was thinking it would be kind of that thing, ambitious, but flawed. And I watched it the night I got access to it with my wife. And we got it pretty late. So it finished at like two in the morning and we looked at each other and we both went, that was, that was actually really good. My wife didn't even want to watch it. And she was like, that, that actually was really good. It was worth staying up till two in the morning to watch it. For me, this is our S tier DCEU film. I, th I thought it was just fantastic. And it's an example of what can happen when you have a large cast of characters that you have to introduce. And so you make it a truly epic film where they're allowed to slowly set everything up in detail and have a complete story about these characters, these mini stories inside of it, backstories, relationships with, a, with fathers, quests, journeys, and play them out properly. I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells, he's never fought us. Not us united. And it's fascinating because we have the two different versions. You can see how filmmaking is supposed to work by watching the two versions where this version sets things up, develops it, and then pays it off. 
And in Justice League, they do a reshoot to have one line of dialogue that sets something up and then they just show the payoff. None of the tension, none of the development, none of the working through things. It's just, here's an idea. Here's the thing. Let's move on to the next one. And here, there's so many things where because it plays out at the right pace with the right amount of information, when things come together, it's so satisfying. I loved this. It was so much better than I was expecting it to be. And I, I really wanted it to be great. I just went in with tampered expectations and it exceeded all of them. Um, I, I This is one of my favorite comic book movies of all time. Moving right along, The Suicide Squad. And this is one of these interesting movies simply because of the backstory. It wasn't supposed to exist. Disney overreacts to some tweets from James Gunn being revealed on the internet. So they fire him from directing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. DC goes, we think that guy's talented. Swap him up. And he decides he wants to do the Suicide Squad. And we get this movie and it is great. This is one of the better films in the DCEU, and it is a pretty well classic James Gunn film. What do I mean by that? He's really good with ensembles and taking D-level characters, C-level characters, weird characters, and finding their humanity. Finding the way to take Polka Dot Man and anchor him to something that we can all relate to, parental expectations. We can relate to these different parents uh, and children having, you know, failing repeatedly and your child seeing that over and over again. Or if you're a child that has a parent that keeps disappointing you, there's all these little things that anchor it to reality and make it relatable while being ridiculous at the exact same time and just being able to find Little arcs for everybody. Even King Shark has a bit of an arc in here. Polka Dot Man has this payoff in the finale. Bloodsport has this payoff in the finale. And it's actually emotionally resonant. You feel something. I wish they hadn't spoiled a couple of them in the trailer for the film. But you feel something because you care about the characters and the little journey that they're, they're on. That's my dad. And he's able to have you care about them while being able to have silly comedy and big massive action at the exact same time. That is James Gunn's skill set. And beyond that, it's with comic book movies, you need to pull in outside inspiration. So he's pulling from Dirty Dozen and all of these 60s and 70s war films. And because of it, you get a great superhero film. Next up, our one TV show, Peacemaker. I wasn't really sure what to make of this one going into it because I disliked Peacemaker so much coming out of the Suicide Squad and they'd made him just such a jerk. And once again, James Gunn worked his magic and they found the humanity in this character that's ridiculous and deeply unlikable. And that's what he builds off of. This person that knows he's ridiculous, knows he's deeply unlikable, and he's sad about that. He know, like he feels what the audience felt at the end of the Suicide Squad. And he builds the arc of this character around that. And so for me, this show is different, but flawed. Or am, I don't know, ambitious isn't the right word, but I, I loved how it's different. But I, I like the characters and their interactions and the humor more so than the plot. The plot to me on this show, pretty forgettable. Like, it, it's like, oh yeah, something about moths and bugs or something like that. But what I, I loved about this show was the interactions and them sitting around talking and where friendships are formed. And as you slowly start to understand why Peacemaker the way is the way that he is. And then likewise, understanding his childhood trauma, how he's trying to be a better person. And so all of that really worked for me. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, like I said, the main plot is pretty forgettable. <laughs> so for me, different, but flawed. Real quick before we cover the final three movies in here, remember you can create your own 
tier list for the DCU films and TV show at the link down below in the description. If you post it on your social media, Instagram or Twitter and tag me, I will share some of my favorites that I find the most interesting. Links for all of that are down below in the description. Also, I've done other tier rankings just like this one about the Spider-Man movies, the MCU. You can check those out right up here. We're in our final stretch with Black Adam. And I know the internet just loves to dunk on this movie because The Rock oversold it and the post credit scene promised something that will never be paid off. It underperformed at the box office. I had a lot of fun with it, a lot of fun with it. And then rewatched it a couple months back and I still had a lot of fun with it, but it is a very safe blockbuster. So it's safe, but it's a ton of fun. And it's a movie that it's not pretentious. It's not trying to explore big, gigantic ideas. It doesn't, besides The Rock, maybe thinking he's more important than he is, the movie itself is just trying to deliver cool action sequences and funny lines, a nice ensemble of the Justice Society. All that stuff worked for me. It's nice to see Pierce Brosnan in a comic book movie Movie as a whole, it kind of feels like other superhero stuff where we've got people with capes. Sometimes Black Adam doesn't have a cape flying around, punching each other through buildings. Stuff that was like super cutting edge in 2010 with that level of like detail, CGI and everything like that. We've seen a lot of this over the last 13 years. And this movie's been in development for 15 years. It was in development a long time. Here I am. At the time, if they'd released it then, with something even in this ballpark, it would have been much fresher, more inventive. Now it's very familiar. Familiar doesn't mean bad. Familiar means I've seen something like this before. But I still have spun with this sort of thing. So I enjoy it, enjoyed it more than most people. Our next to last film is the first of two box office bombs for DC this year alone, Shazam! Fury of the Gods. And this is another one for me that I'm going to put in the fun but very flawed category. And it's frustrating because there's a lot of things in here. I, I, I thought I, I enjoyed kind of some of the way they expanded the mythology, the way it kind of tied back to the first movie. The cast here is still charming, in particularly Zachary Levi as the man child. <laughs> I just threw a truck at a dragon. I love my life. It still really works for me. The The big problem is that they made a movie that essentially violates the prin principle on which this franchise exists. The whole point of Shazam is that it's big with a superhero. That it's a child in a big grown man superhero's body. And... Because the amount of time that passed, all of a sudden we're talking about them graduating high school, going off to college, and maturing. So the whole gimmick isn't very present in the film. The whole thing for why these things exist, for why we we love them, have fun with the Shazam, it's 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 not there as much as it should be. And so the gap, this was in the present, the first one too, but the gap between Billy and Shazam's silliness feels much more dramatic to where you just have fairly mature teenager and then he becomes a grown up and all of a sudden he's very silly and goofy. You are very menacing. I just want you to know that. And the whole, the whole thing that makes these movies stand out just kind of fades. I still had fun with it. There were things in the story that worked for me, but overall, a pretty significant decline in quality because it lost that heart, the emotion, the thing that made it stand out in the first place. And finally, The Flash. And this has been a wild roller coaster of different reactions to this movie. Coming out of CinemaCon, the buzz was one of the best comic book movies of all time. David Zaslav, the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery, said it's 
his favorite superhero movie of all time. And then he cried a bunch while he was watching it. And then they kind of ran with that narrative of it's one of the best and biggest comic book movies of all time. And then even some of the early fan screenings, like very positive reaction to it. And then about a week before the movie came out, the narrative starts to shift towards, oh, wow, the VFX are awful. So for me, I've seen it twice. I think it's pretty great. I'm safely putting it in that great category. There are some issues that hold it back from the S tier, but for me, the central journey that Barry is on about a parent, or excuse me, a child losing a parent too soon, kind of both parents too soon, I, I think that's very profound. And being on that journey of processing that, uh, like my dad died when I was 20, in which case I think there's themes in this movie for specific people. It just hits a little closer to home. It resonates a little bit more. If you lost a parent or a loved one too soon, this movie has a little bit something that you'll connect with a little bit more. Likewise, Batman 89, Michael Keaton, that's one of my earliest childhood memories of going to the theater. It's essentially my earliest memory of kind of getting into movie fandom, nerd culture. I collected all of the trading cards for Batman 89 and they brought him back. So for me... This was my No Way Home, except as someone that had some issues with the setup for No Way Home, this movie I thought delivered a better setup. Likewise, I love the cold open. It just feels like a segment pulled from the Justice League animated show from 20 years ago and Justice League Unlimited it feels like that, except in live action. But I think it emotionally worked for me. I like the journey Barry is on. I love the bringing in the Flashpoint in this DCEU version of it. Michael Keaton was fantastic. So for me, I'm putting it in the great category. There you have it. This is my completed tier ranking of the DCEU. You can create yours down below with that link in the below, down below in the description. Share it on your social media and tag me and I will reshare some of my favorites or the ones that I find the most interesting of yours. You can find more of my tier rankings right over there in that playlist. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.